Despite the difficulties faced on the first day of Operation Uranus, overnight on the 19th to 20th of November 1942, Vatutin and Rokossovsky told their units to persevere with the plan. But they also encouraged their rifle and cavalry forces to move up and encircle and destroy any bypassed Romanian forces and get to the Krivaya and Sher rivers. Well, fighting throughout the night, the 6th Guards Cavalry Division managed to take the Romanian strongpoint at Platonov, while 5th Guards Cavalry Division captured the strongpoint of Zelovanov and Vlasov by 0700 hours. The Germans reacted by sending the 177th Sturmgeschütz Battalion to the 11th Army Corps overnight. The 44th Infantry Division began to move its 132nd Infantry Regiment to reinforce the 14th Panzer Division, the latter having been ordered to move to Verkny Buzinovka, which they were now arriving at in the morning. And the 16th Panzer Division was one of the units ordered by Paulus to pull out of the line and head west to the Lipo Lugovsky area with the intention of blocking the route to Kalach. Well, it was chaos. Overnight, from the 19th to the 20th, Hyacinth Graf Strachwitz von Grossoker on Kamenetz had to beg and steal fuel in order to get his panzers moving, and when he eventually reached the designated area, only four tanks had made it. Angern couldn't pull out all the infantry either, and so the first lot to arrive were rear services personnel. To move units of 14th, 24th and 16th Panzer Divisions, infantry divisions transport columns are temporarily confiscated. There are no fuel reserves left. 24th Panzer Division was also due to pull out of the line, but only elements of the division went west. And McLean notes that, due to the shortage of fuel, the 44th Infantry Division realised that most of its motor-drawn equipment would have to be abandoned in the event of a retreat which is something we need to bear in mind as we progress through this period of the campaign. At dawn, a battle engulfed the Bushini region, where the remnants of the Romanian 14th Infantry Division, assisted by tanks and motorised infantry from the 22nd Panzer Division, desperately tried to hold on against the 1st Tank Corps, 2 of 8th Cavalry Corps divisions, and the dismounted 8th Motorcycle Regiment. The Soviets managed to capture a farm, but the Germans had dug into the area south of it and stalled them in the morning. And at 0750 hours, the 6th Army reported to Army Group B that Soviet tanks and cavalry had been spotted ahead of the line they were erecting around the Romanian 1st Cavalry Division, and that the 14th and 24th Panzer Divisions, plus the 295th and 389th Panzer Jäger and 244th Sturmgeschütz Battalions were on their way. But, according to Colonel Adam, Paulus was of the opinion that they should have withdrawn the 6th Army previously, and should be withdrawing it now. Apparently, Paulus once more asked permission from von Weichs to withdraw, but obviously it was refused. And Hitler is to blame, of course. Well, if that's true, then rather than just condemning Paulus for not disobeying the Führer's orders, Von Weichs should also take some of the blame for not having defied Hitler as well. But again, as I explained last time, it, it doesn't make sense for Paulus to issue a withdrawal at the present moment, so Adam's account sounds suspect. It is still not possible to obtain accurate information about the composition and strength of Russian forces in the area of the breakthrough south of Kletskaya. As the report indicated, 6th Army, which had only fragmentary information at its disposal, was not yet fully aware of the size of the Soviet force heading into its rear area, nor were the measures it took to move forces westward commensurate with the scale of the Soviet threat. When more information was received and the dire situation revealed itself at 0945 hours, Paulus instructed Zylitz to send even more forces west. Meanwhile, the 119th Rifle Division, with 50th Guards Rifle Division on the left, and the 216th and 19th Tank Brigades of 26th Tank Corps in support, wheeled eastward and reached the Tsaritsa River by noon. The Romanians in the area made moves to escape to the south, as Romanian tanks and a composite regiment made up of troops from the 6th and 13th Divisions counterattacked these Soviet divisions. To the east, the Romanian 15th Infantry Division was hit by two battalions of infantry and a force of 40 T-34s. 
but they repelled this attack and destroyed five tanks, boosting the morale of the troops. This success solidified the Romanian lines here for the next couple of days, although Axworthy notes this. The German-supplied French 75mm anti-tank guns proved ineffective in this action, which was decided by the infantry. This is interesting because you'd think that 75mm guns would have been effective. Now, a bit of speculation here because I don't have all the details, but glorious Wikipedia says that these guns could penetrate a T-34 when using high-explosive anti-tank ammunition. However, the low muzzle velocity caused insufficient performance when firing regular armour-piercing shells. Of course, there's no reference to back up what it's saying, which is unsurprising for Wikipedia, but if the Romanians weren't given heat ammunition, this might explain why the guns didn't perform as expected. Despite repulsing the Soviet assault, the 15th Division's right wing fell back slightly, along with the 13th Infantry Division. And at 0700 hours, Chaperkin's 5th Guards Cavalry Division attacked and seized two villages that the Romanians had turned into strong points, and then burst south. Well, at the same time, the Romanian 1st Cavalry Division, supported by infantry and 30 R1 tanks, conducted a mounted sortie to the southwest, trying to re-establish contact with the rest of the Romanian 3rd Army. They ran into Chaperkin's cavalry at 0800 hours, who happily smashed the Romanian attack and sent them reeling back to the southeast. Having run out of fuel, the Romanians burned the last of their R1 tanks before fleeing, and this had all happened within an hour or so because at 0900 hours, 5th Guards Cavalry Division continued southeast, reaching Verkny Buzinovka in the late afternoon and running into German panzers from 14th Panzer Division, who forced them to withdraw for the evening. To the east, 304th and 252nd Rifle and 27th Guards Rifle Divisions began their assault just after dawn, and heavy fighting broke out as they moved deep into the Romanian defences over the next several hours. Batov decided to create a small mobile group from 91st Tank Brigade to exploit this partial success. Well, at 1200 hours, Anisimov advanced through the 252nd Rifle Division and raced off into the Romanian and German rear areas. They overran small groups of Axis troops and support units, advanced 23 kilometers, and moved onto the airstrip near Oskinski, destroying several aircraft there. Due to the bad weather, Fiebig had only evacuated about a third of his aircraft, which is why several were sat on the airstrip. After clearing up the airfield, Anisimov then raided Goliban, where the headquarters of the German 44th Infantry Division was, capturing a field hospital and causing a panic among the German ranks. They were thrown back from this, but the entire affair had convinced Strecker's 11th Army Corps that their position in the Don Bend was in jeopardy. And at some point this day, the commander of the 6th Romanian Infantry Division, General Mihail Laskar, assumed command of the various units now being isolated in the Bazkovsky area. This was because the Soviets had either cut off or wiped out the Romanian Army and Corps headquarters, except for the 1st Corps headquarters on the left flank. Well, it was looking increasingly likely that Group Laskar would end up in encirclement if the Axis armoured forces couldn't stop the Soviets now. However, some have argued that Laskar, an experienced leader who had taken part in the Siege of Sevastopol, could have retreated south on this day and avoided the trap. But they say Hitler forbade a retreat, and he sealed their doom. Great argument. Except there's a little problem with it. Hitler only gave that order on the 21st, not the 20th. And as we shall see, on the 21st, when Hitler gave that order, the Laskar group was either already surrounded or was about to be. So Hitler wasn't dooming it to encirclement, it was already doomed, and he was ordering it to fight to the last man, knowing full well that he couldn't get it out. And from Hitler's perspective, there's no point in Laskar just giving up. So this was the correct decision. But by changing the time of the events to the day before, now, some authors have come to a false conclusion, which is why I've said it before, and I will say it again, 
events should always be placed in chronological order. Stop writing your history books out of order. There's also more issues with this argument, which we'll get to when we see the action on the 21st, but in reality, events simply overtook Laskar before he was able to gain control of his units and before he could make a decision to go south. The German 48th Panzer Corps was tasked with breaking through to Laskar and getting it out, but they had no communication with him and couldn't coordinate their actions. So, Group Laskar stayed in place on the 20th, sealing their doom. A battle raged all morning in the Pashani region between Axis and Soviet tank, infantry and cavalry forces. The 47th Guards Rifle Division, with 8th Guards Tank Brigade in support, ground their way south and managed to surprise the Romanian 7th Cavalry Division, who were preparing to advance elsewhere. The Romanians fled in the face of the Soviet tanks, with the 47th Guards Division reporting that the Romanians had lost at least 3,000 dead, with 7,000 taken prisoner. The Romanian 9th Infantry Division's right wing also began to give ground, thanks to the efforts of the 203rd and 159th Rifle, 14th Guards Rifle, and 21st Cavalry Divisions. Romanenka, though, got impatient with the progress made so far, and ordered Butkov to leave the cavalry to fight there, bypass Pashani to the east, and then thrust south. So, disengaging most of his force from 22nd Panzer Division, Butkov turned his positions over to the 8th Cavalry Corps by 1800 hours, refueled his tanks, and moved southeastward. Several farms and villages fell by 2130 hours, but he was unable to disengage all his forces, and so some of his tanks continued to fight the 22nd Panzer Division until night fell. Rort was forced to fall back south, although kept the Soviets tied down in the process. By skillfully employing its armoured personnel carriers and a handful of tanks, Rort's division fought far more effectively than its actual strength warranted. Romanenka also ordered the 8th Motorcycle Regiment to move east, in case the Romanians in the Bazkovsky area attempted to break out of the potential encirclement. But it was Rodin's tank corps that did the most distance this day, making up for their slow pace the day before. The 157th Tank Brigade, now commanded by Major Makur, was joined by the 14th Motorized Rifle Brigade and raced south, wiping out any Romanian troops it found in its way. They reached Perelazovsky in the morning and rolled into the Romanian 5th Army Corps headquarters, capturing most of the staff and its documents. Perhaps most importantly, they captured the fuel dump intact. Rodin then set up his headquarters in the town, and at noon, a German liaison officer walked into it without realising what had happened and was also captured. Makur went another couple of kilometres south to another town where they battled Romanian forces for a few hours, before having to wait for the rest of the corps to catch up. In the process of the day, Rodin's corps had also captured the rear services elements of the Romanian 1st Armoured Division, and the Romanian trucks and drivers were now forced to accompany the Soviet tanks. But Rodin has received criticism for staying here and not advancing further, since the area before him was clear. However, as Isseyev argues, he was ahead of the other units and was waiting for them to catch up. If he had gone further, then an Axis counterattack may have resulted in his unit being cut off. So, really, the criticism here wasn't that Rodin didn't go further, but that the 1st Tank Corps had been delayed. On their eastern flank, the Romanian 1st Armoured Division counterattacked the 119th Rifle Division and 19th Tank Brigade. The commander of the 119th Rifle Division complained that he was surrounded, which wasn't true, so Romanenka sacked him. And then the Romanians were repulsed and compelled to fall back, so the commander hadn't needed to panic. Unable to link up with the 22nd Panzer Division, Georgi withdrew eastwards and quickly made plans to escape towards the southwest. 1st Armoured Division had lost 25 tanks so far, while the 22nd Panzer Division had lost less than 20, although the exact number isn't clear. In contrast, the Soviet 1st Tank Army had lost 50 tanks by this point. 
The fact remains, though, that the two significantly understrength German and Romanian armoured divisions, plus the cavalry and the 14th and 5th infantry divisions, had tied down all but one of the 1st Tank Army's tank brigades for an entire day. Only the 157th Tank and the 14th Motorized Brigade were able to make forward progress. And while the Soviets had the advantage, they were also significantly behind schedule. According to the plan, 1st Tank Corps was to have broken through 25 to 30 kilometers south of the point where it was located on the evening of the 20th of November. It was clear at this point that the Romanian 3rd Army was disintegrating. Three of its four corps headquarters ceased to exist, and three of its divisions had been combined into Group Laskar. The Romanian 1st Armoured Division was the only unit south of Group Laskar that was keeping the connection open, but was itself in danger of being cut off. The Romanian 7th Cavalry and German 22nd Panzer Divisions struggled to restore the situation, while the 1st Cavalry Division was on its last legs. It, plus its supporting elements, were now subordinated to the German 11th Army Corps. So really, only the Romanian 1st Army Corps had achieved success, and it's probably no coincidence that they also hadn't faced significant Soviet tank forces, or were the focus of the attack. Only its right wing gave way, and that was because Romanenko had sent an entire new rifle division into the area, and had tanks there too. The attack in the west was breaking through the lines, even if it was behind schedule. The Germans were rushing up reinforcements, and there was still a chance that they could derail it. But then, far to the east, the rumble of artillery fire could be heard, and a new attack was launched. All hope for the 6th Army was about to disappear, as we're about to find out. This would have been the perfect time to strike Chirikov and wipe him out. The weather had deteriorated to the point that the ice on the Volga basically blocked it. Chirikov now struggled to supply his men, and a serious strike against him probably would have been catastrophic. But it was not to be. South of the city, Yeremenko's Stalingrad front was about to start his attack into the Romanian divisions of Hot's 4th Panzer Army. If the Axis were already struggling, they were about to see the situation get completely out of hand. And I just want to clarify something because people were asking in the previous videos, how come I said that the German 4th Panzer Army was in charge of this sector, not the 4th Romanian Army? Well, it's because the 4th Romanian Army had not been set up yet. I know a lot of the books, Wikipedia, and TV documentaries, including the Soviet Storm series that everyone keeps telling me to watch, all say that the 4th Romanian Army was the one sat south of Stalingrad. But this wasn't true. It was due to be established on the 21st of November 1942, the next day, but this never happened. The situation of 6th and 7th Corps was already so catastrophic that General Konstantinenko's 4th Army HQ was never able to take over operational control of them from 4th Panzer Army. Anyway, rain in the morning turned to snow a little later, grounding most aircraft. Coupled with the fog, this forced Yeromenko to delay most of his artillery bombardment, and he had to justify himself to Stalin. Yeremenka explained the local weather situation and assured Moscow the attacking troops were ready. He said he was just waiting for the proper moment to attack. Once again, Stalin accepted a military decision from a senior commander and did not force the issue. Rather than starting at 0800 hours, the artillery fired at 1000 hours, except for 51st Army, which started at 0730 hours because they hadn't received the order to delay, and the 64th Army's artillery only started up in the afternoon. The fog also dampened its effectiveness, but having not heard about the delay, at 0830 hours, Trofanov's forces attacked. Vasilenka's 15th Guards Rifle Division and support tanks smashed through the Romanian 18th Infantry Division, causing the Romanians to flee. The 302nd and 126th Rifle Divisions, each supported by a tank regiment and both backed by the 254th Tank Brigade, also crashed through the Romanian lines. 
1st Romanian Infantry Division, with only five battalions because of previous casualties, had no chance, and their line quickly evaporated. Large numbers of Romanians simply surrendered, but at one hill in the area, the Soviets were stopped by the 2nd Battalion of the 85th Romanian Regiment, which was supported by two batteries of German 88mm guns. The Soviets had to bring up both their tank regiments in order to overwhelm the defenders, who then fled west with the rest of the division. To the north, at 11.15 hours, Tolbukhin's infantry, supported initially by 54 tanks, shattered the Romanian 2nd Infantry Division. This division wasn't really a division since it only had 4 battalions, and basically had no chance. The men broke and fled with tank fright by 1200 hours, while the 422nd Rifle Division and its supporting tank forces reached the village of Koshari by the end of the day, losing 24 of their 28 tanks, mostly to Soviet mines that had been laid earlier in the campaign. The 169th Rifle Division and 90th Tank Brigade captured several villages on their way west, and the 143rd Rifle Brigade pushed south. They linked up with Vasilenka's 15th Guards Rifle Division and encircled most of the Romanian 2nd Infantry Division. Reacting to events, at 10.30 hours, Hot ordered Liza to counterattack and strike the Soviet forces on their left flank, and it just so happened that the 29th Motorized Division was conducting a field exercise at the time, so it was prepared and able to move off straight away. With either 59 or 60 panzers, the division engaged the 169th Rifle Division and the 90th Tank Brigade, liberating a surrounded Romanian garrison who had stood their ground the entire day. Now, as Jason DeMarc points out in Panzerkrieg Volume 1, and guys, you should be reading Jason DeMarc's books, many of the Western authors describe 29th Motorized Division's attack incorrectly. Some, including David Glantz, say that the Panzers engaged the bulk of the 13th Tank Corps. Jason DeMarc explains why, but no, it didn't happen. The only tanks they engaged were those accompanying the infantry. The Soviet riflemen were forced back, and Milishev's brigade was surprised by the sudden appearance of German Panzers. A shootout occurred, and after several Soviet tanks were taken out, including all their KVs, Milishev retreated. The Germans probably lost five panzers in this action. There's a bit more to it, but that's roughly what happened. Well, some of the other authors go a little bit further with their descriptions, to the point of absurdity. Craig, in his book Enemy at the Gates, describes how the panzers ambushed a Soviet armoured train and blasted the carriages to pieces, describing how the men were seen cartwheeling out of them. Also, according to Craig, many of the Soviet tanks were spotted ramming each other and firing aimlessly as the Germans picked them off. Well, none of this is mentioned in Jason DeMarc's more detailed work, and Werner Happ states that the 29th Motorized Division's counterattack was so successful that it almost reached Bikitovka. But that's just another wild exaggeration by an author with a clear agenda. By the evening, the 29th Motorized Division had reached a position just 500 metres from the original Romanian front line, but no further. Yes, they had stopped the Soviets in their area, and had done well, but hadn't the chance of bringing the entire Soviet offensive to a halt, and it's worth remembering all this because it'll become important in the next episode. In fact, rather than the 29th Motorized Division, it was the Soviets that advanced the furthest. At 1300 hours, Volsky's 4th Mechanized Corps drove west in order to exploit into the depths of the Axis front. Since the ground had already been cleared of enemy forces by the infantry and their tank support, Volsky's force met no resistance on their move towards Plodavite, although they were delayed by mines. The village was defended by the Romanian 18th Infantry Division's reconnaissance and engineer battalions, plus a battery of German 88mm guns and some more R1 tanks. The 36th Mechanized Brigade and supporting tanks drove into the village and ended up in a firefight that lasted throughout the night. 
and having fired their artillery in the morning, the artillery units behind the 51st and 57th Armies had packed up and moved north to the 64th Army sector, since there wasn't enough artillery to go around. Well, at 14.20 hours, a second artillery barrage started, and at 15.35 hours, three of Shumilov's rifle divisions, plus two tank brigades, attacked westwards into the German and Romanian lines. The German 523rd Regiment of 297th Infantry Division held back the 204th Rifle Division, but the Romanian 20th Infantry Division's lines collapsed in the face of the 157th and 38th Rifle Divisions. Richthofen complained in his diary that the Romanians had offered no resistance and that tank panic had taken over. He said everything that the Germans had worked for over the past few months was ruined in a single day. That's fine, but it's no wonder that the Romanians fled. Giebler had been in touch with the commander of the adjoining Romanian regiment from Romanian 20th Infantry Division, Colonel Gross, who had served in the Austro-Hungarian Army and so spoke good German. Gross's men had only a single 3.7cm horse-drawn pack anti-tank gun for the whole of his sector but the Romanian peasant soldiers fought bravely, considering that they had been left on their own. This may be a little bit of an exaggeration, because the Romanians had more guns than that, and the Soviet sources also indicate that they had more than one gun per regiment. But there's no doubt that they were inadequately armed. Anthony Beaver goes on to say how they faced waves and waves of Soviet tanks and riflemen, in quantities never seen before. Which is ridiculous. The Romanian 20th Division did face three rifle divisions, two brigades of tanks initially, and then the 13th Tank Corps later, as we shall see. But that's not exactly waves of tanks or men, nor was it in quantities never seen before. This was a relatively small force compared to what we've seen previously. It's just that the Romanians were stretched too thin and weren't sufficiently supplied or supported to deal with them. That was a fine mess, a gaping hole in our left flank and now also on the right. His attacking spearheads were rapidly getting closer, and we had no reserves from which to repulse this deadly danger. So, even though this would have been a great time to take out Chirikov, Paulus had no choice but to give the order to cease all attacks in Stalingrad at 14.45 hours on the 20th of November 1942. And he started to transfer forces westwards to help out the Romanian 3rd Army. And at this point, he still only wanted to create a defensive line in the west to block the Soviets before they reached the Don, and there was a chance that this could happen, especially since the 16th and 24th Panzer and 3rd Motorized Divisions were on their way. If we look at the map, the Soviets in the west were still a significant distance away from the Don, and the 6th Army wasn't yet in encirclement, although that was becoming increasingly likely. Still, it's clear that Paulus didn't have enough forces to plug the gap in the west and the gap in the south, and the units he had racing west were not exactly fresh units. However, imposing this array of division symbols looked on 6th Army's operational maps as they reached and crossed the Don River. In reality, these divisions were mere shadows of their former selves, nothing more than hastily assembled battalion or multi-battalion Kampfgruppen with 30 to 35 tanks apiece. Further south, the Soviet 28th Army attacked and managed to surround a German force in a village, but the German 16th Motorized Division managed to counter and link up with the force. The battle raged overnight, with the Germans ultimately pulling back. Schwerin retreated throughout the 21st, and the 28th Army made its way towards Alista. And back in the Stalingrad area, at 16.20 hours, Tolbukhin ordered Tanishishin to attack. But, because not all of Tanishishin's units were ready, many of his trucks were gifted to the rifle divisions to give them extra mobility, and some of his tanks were supporting the riflemen, the remaining third of his riflemen were forced to ride on top of the 78 tanks he had left. The attack also went in clumsily, barely three hours before darkness, all down one road rather than three as planned, with tankers once again forced to rely on compasses to guide them. 
there was a loss of command and control, causing units to go the wrong way, and in the end they didn't advance the 40 kilometers that was hoped, and instead barely went 15. Still, it was clear by this point that the 6th Army was in trouble, and Powers was now aware of the Soviet plan. He could see on the map what they were trying to do, and so this was probably the first time that the Germans had confirmation of what the Soviet plan was, to encircle the 6th Army. Colonel Adams states that he and Paulus were worried that the German 11th Army Corps would be cut off from the bulk of the 6th Army as well, and this was actually in alignment with the Soviet plan, so if true, Paulus and Adam were aware that there might be two encirclements, not just one. Adam also points out that they were facing a terrible catastrophe if the German command didn't act quickly. The question is, would they react? Let's find out. Unsurprisingly, the German High Command was reacting to the events on the 20th of November 1942. For starters, Hitler could see that the 6th Army was threatened with encirclement, and decided to create a new army group in the Stalingrad region. Up to this point, von Weichs' Army Group B was along the Don, and Army Group A was in the Caucasus under Hitler's direct control. Well, Hitler was facing two catastrophes, one at Stalingrad and another in the West as well, and couldn't also command an army group in the Caucasus. So he allowed Kleist of 1st Panzer Army to take command of Army Group A, and von Mackensen became the commander of the 1st Panzer Army. But von Weichs was in a lot of trouble, and was commanding six armies, two of which had disintegrated, another was being encircled and just happened to be the largest army on the Eastern Front, and two of the remaining three armies, plus one and a half of the two armies that had disintegrated, were Axis Allied armies who spoke three different languages that weren't German. In other words, von Weichs was overwhelmed and couldn't possibly deal with everything that was going on. Hitler had previously wanted to establish a new army group in the area under the command of Romanian Marshal Antonescu, but had wanted to oversee the fall of Stalingrad first, so it never happened because Stalingrad didn't fall. But the situation had gotten out of control, and now required the setting up of a brand new army group, Army Group Don. Therefore, Hitler needed someone new who was an experienced commander to command this army group, and sort the situation out. So, of course, he chose for the role the greatest general that has ever lived. A man who could turn water into Aryan blood, and use that blood to power his panzers. A godlike figure of such brilliance that, if only Madman Hitler hadn't stopped him, would have won the war before it had even begun by retreating all the way to Berlin. I am, of course, referring to none other than Erik von Manstein. Praise be. May your wars be like lightning and blessed by the will of the Manstein. Jokes aside, Manstein had done very well up to now and was the obvious choice for the role as commander of the new army group. He had been in command of the 11th Army, which had been sent to Army Group North and then Centre after clearing up the Crimea, and Manstein had been the one to come up with a plan to take down France, so he was a decent general. But the reason I introduced him with a hefty amount of sarcasm was because of his book, Lost Victories, where he argued that he was the greatest thing since sliced bread that he only lost because of Hitler, and that he never did anything wrong. Well, I'm here to tell you that none of that is true, as we will discover as this series goes on. For now though, Manstein was ordered by Hitler to set up Army Group Don, and was given command of the remnants of the German 4th Panzer and Romanian 3rd Armies, as well as the German 6th Army. And because the 29th Motorized Division would end up retreating northward into the Stalingrad pocket, for reasons I'll explain next episode, this meant that the German 4th Panzer Army wouldn't actually have any German units for Manstein, except for the 16th Motorized Division to the south. Worse, Manstein didn't have a full headquarters staff, and there was no front line in the Chur area. And the weather prevented him from flying to the Don area, meaning that he had to take the train, which meant he wouldn't arrive for five days. So, to be as fair to Manstein as possible, 
at this stage, he faced insurmountable odds. Given the situation, Manstein had to make bricks without straw. What we should need to restore the situation would be forces amounting to an army in strength, none of which, if possible, should be used for a counter-offensive until their assembly was fully complete. General Zeitzler agreed with me, and promised to try and let us have an armoured division and two or three infantry divisions by way of addition. In addition to all this, we have to consider the actions of one man, Luftwaffe Chief of Staff Hans Jesenek. Jesenek arrived at Berchtesgaden on the 20th, and spoke to Hitler about how the Luftwaffe could support a relief or breakout operation. Clearly indicating that Hitler and his generals understood before the encirclement that the aim of Operation Uranus was to encircle the 6th Army. Hitler asked Jesenek if the Luftwaffe could supply the 6th Army by air for a short period, while Manstein assembled a force to break Paulus out of the pocket that hadn't yet formed. Now, there's a lot of myths floating around about the airlift idea, in fact so many that I can't possibly list them all, but we'll try and tackle a couple here. Some famous historians like Samuel Mitchum, Franz Kurowski, and even Ian Kershaw state incorrectly that Hermann Goering was the one who assured Hitler that it could be done and that Jesenek did not contradict him. Since the war, almost all writers on the Battle of Stalingrad have blamed Goering for the airlift, claiming that when Hitler asked him what the Air Force could do, he made rash promises of an airlift, hoping its success would restore his flagging prestige. Well, no, that's not what happened. Hermann Goering wasn't with Jesenek, and Hermann Goering wasn't the one who suggested the airlift operation. Hermann Goering was chairing a meeting about the oil and fuel shortage at his estate, Karen Hall, and was too busy to see the Führer. Hitler, seeing that the Soviets were trying to encircle the 6th Army, summoned Jesenek to find out if an airlift was possible. It was Jesenek who agreed with Hitler and said that an airlift was possible, and he said this on the 20th of November, not the 22nd. Some authors say that he said this on the 22nd, which was after the encirclement had happened. But no, Goering arrived to speak with Hitler on the 22nd, and I think these authors are confusing the two dates. It was the 20th when the airlift was first suggested and agreed upon, which was, as we can see, before the encirclement of the 6th Army. When Hitler asked Jesenek if an airlift was possible, Jesenek said it could work if they held onto the nearby airfields and used bombers as well as transport aircraft. He said that they had successfully supplied the Demyansk pocket earlier in the year, and that they could do the same again at Stalingrad. Just to briefly explain this, as we'll get into the numbers a bit more in a future episode, but only 100,000 soldiers were trapped at Demyansk, and they had barely managed to keep them supplied. The Stalingrad pocket would end up having almost three times as many soldiers trapped within it, so supplying the 6th Army was going to be a significantly more daunting task. However, at this stage, Hitler only asked if they could supply the 6th Army for a short time before Manstein got them out. So perhaps Jesenek wasn't expecting them to hold out for very long. And neither was Hitler, since Manstein was on his way after all. Well, after agreeing to the airlift idea, Hitler boarded his special train and rushed from Berchtesgaden to his headquarters in East Prussia. He was accompanied by Jodl and Keitel from the OKW, not Zeitler or the other staff from the OKH, and according to David Glantz, they negatively influenced his view of what was happening. For two months, Hitler had deliberately cut OKW out of Eastern operations, which meant that Jodl and Keitel had no real sense of the weakness of Army Group B or the gravity of the Soviet threat. For example, when the Uranus storm broke, their first suggestion was to move a single panzer division from Army Group North to create a reserve in the south. During this period, the Germans sent a significant number of troops and aircraft to Tunisia after the Allied landings in North Africa. Field Marshal Erwin Rommel was against these reinforcements, and Hitler was sending troops to North Africa when the Eastern Front needed them most. David Glantz might actually be wrong here for two reasons. One, Hitler stopped the train several times to speak to Zeitzler on the phone. 
so he wasn't completely in the dark about what was happening. And two, it's not certain that Hitler could have sent all these troops to the Eastern Front rather than North Africa. There's a few practical reasons for this. On the 4th or 6th of November 1942, Hitler had ordered the 6th Panzer Division to transfer from France to Army Group B. Yet, the division wouldn't arrive until December. It took them over a month to get to the Stalingrad area. So even if Hitler had wanted to send a bunch of extra divisions to the Don area, they wouldn't have arrived until mid to late December anyway. In time for Manstein's counter-offensive, but was far too late to make a difference at this stage of the fighting. In reality, the only viable option to get troops to the Stalingrad area in sufficient time to help Paulus before the pocket closed, or just after, was for the Germans to rob units from their other formations on the Eastern Front, not transfer troops from Central or Western Europe or wherever. In contrast, the Allies landed in French North Africa on the 8th of November 1942, and this took the Axis completely by surprise. It was only on the 10th of November that Hitler made the decision to land forces in Tunisia, yet by the end of November they were delivering thousands of men per day into Tunisia by both sea and air. At least 68,000 had arrived by the end of December, so it was much easier to send troops to Tunisia than it was to the Don, partly because it's a shorter distance to North Africa from Central Europe than it is to the Don, and also, the road, rail and air network in Central Europe was far better than it was in the East. Mussolini, supposedly, made the trains run on time. So it was quicker to send troops south through Italy than to send them east, where the Reichsbahn was a complete mess. They could also supply them better too. There's no point sending hundreds of thousands of men to the Don area if they can't supply them there due to the poor logistics of Eastern Europe especially in the middle of a winter where conditions were much worse. Now, the North African campaign did have a massive impact on what was happening at Stalingrad, although not necessarily because of the troop transfers. Hitler was now facing a catastrophe in both the East and the West. His attention was pulled in two directions, as were the Axis overall. Hitler had to occupy the remainder of Vichy France on the 11th of November. He had to deal with the Italians, whom he feared were losing the will to fight. He had also lost the initiative. He was now reacting to events. And as time went on, the Fuhrer became overworked and paralysed by the strain of the whole situation. This pressure may have been part of the reason why some decisions were made in haste, or why there just weren't enough troops to do everything that was needed to be done. And overall, Colonel Adams' prayer that the German High Command would act fast to save the 6th Army was a waste of time. They had no divisions anywhere near the front, and even if they made the decision to send units there straight away, it would take weeks before they arrived. Hitler also couldn't just neglect what was happening in the West or North Africa which is why the North African campaign is important. So, while you're waiting for me to create the next episode of Stalingrad, why don't you check out my videos on the North African campaign? There's more to this war than just Stalingrad, you know. And ultimately, the 6th Army had to look after itself. So, could they do that? Would Paulus make the decision to retreat from Stalingrad to save his army? We'll find out next time. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.